All right, so first, um, what I really wanna say is that I am not an expert on autism. I am a mom of a child with autism and I'm a doctor of gynecology, but I'm certainly not a doctor of autism or somebody who specializes in autism. So um, really what I wanna help you guys understand is just my experience going through um, kids with autism that I've worked with and um, kind of what to expect on the range that we can, we can work through. Let's see. So one of the first things I wanted to make sure that we understood is the difference between puberty and adolescence. Um, it's a simple, D distinction, but it's important, I think. Puberty really is the outward changes. And that's what we're gonna talk a lot about today. Because while puberty is, is um, a very physical thing where you start generally with breast buds and you go through and ultimately have your period and so forth, adolescence, particularly for our kids with autism, is not such an easy and defined. Hold on one second. Grace? Grace? Right, this is my fourth child who is driving my van in Atlanta by himself or without an adult. So I'm gonna answer it really fast. Sam, are you in an act? So adolescence is, adolescence is the defined as the time um, between childhood and the beginning of adulthood that includes more of the behavioral and physiologic changes. So <clears throat> we obviously have challenges as anyone does going through um, puberty and adolescence. Ours are a little more, a little more difficult with kids with autism. For one, generally most children with autism don't like change and their body is changing in a major way. It is a tough thing for a neurotypical kid and much less someone who doesn't like change. Um, there are lots of developments in social relationships um, for again, a neurotypical um, change and where our kids where belonging is important but they don't understand, they may not pick up on things. Um, it becomes even more difficult. They certainly don't pick up any information from sibling or peers in a typical way um, for most kids. So that kind of sense of just learning from those around you often doesn't happen. We need to be much more direct. And they don't understand why they're feeling, why their bodies are changing, why they may have these different flutterings inside or why, why they're getting upset more often. And so while again, all teenagers run the risk of depression, kids with autism have a higher risk of depression. One thing that I want to talk about with girls that I think is, is not um, talked about enough is that they also need to understand that boys are changing. I actually took my kids to a program called Girlology and Boyology, which um, is a great program for any child. And they do a lot of cross um, sex teaching to understand that while girls are worried about having their period or making a mess in front of boys, boys are worried about having an erection or ejaculating or, or things like that. So for them to understand that Yes, your body's changing, but so are boys, and we don't want to make them feel uncomfortable either. So I do think that's part that we need to remember. The average age or the onset of puberty, this is a graph that shows you that it's generally around 10. Certainly, we can see it in as young as, as kids in 6 and 7, and as old as kids in 13, um, 13 and 14, and we'll talk about when we need to worry about being delayed, but you see that big spike right around 10. When we talk about puberty, the first thing that changes and the first thing that will let you know that things are going to start getting a little crazy around your house, all that girls will get a breast bud. So it's not so much a mound, it's just right under the nipple. It's like a little firm spot. And sometimes somebody may feel that, particularly a kid um, that has autism that may notice that it feels almost like a jelly bean and it's not a breast mass. It's not breast cancer, although anytime you're worried you come in, but it's that little, that little kind of um, jelly bean under the nipple that will progress to more of a breast elevation, then you kind of get that aerial or mound right underneath the nipple, and then you end up with the adult contour. Same thing with their pubic hair range, you know, pre-pubertal, pre there'll be real no body hair. And then as they start going through, they start having those wisps, then they can have some definite pubic hair, then they'll start to have more of a mound of pubic hair. And then when they're fully adult, that crosses over into the thigh area. So these are called tanner stages. And you may have heard your pediatricians talk about them where they're tanner three or tanner two, and this is where that comes from. But the, for, as parents, the first thing that you'll notice is that little breast bud. So those breasts start developing just a little bit before 10, right around 10 for most people. Pubarchy again, is where that pubic hair starts growing and then they have their big growth spurt. You see having their period or menstruation usually comes right at the very end of that. Um, most people really start noticing the change in 
kind of personality and issues so forth about nine months to a year before the period starts and about nine months to a year after the period starts. Delayed puberty um, is not, you know, kids with autism generally progress on the pubertal scale about the same as neurotypical kids. Again, adolescence can be very different, but puberty is generally fairly typical. Uh, but people are always asking if things are, are later because again, they're, they're younger, acting often. Um, so if they haven't developed breasts by the age of 13, if there's five years difference between that breast growth and their period, if they don't have pubic hair by 14, or if they don't have their periods by 16, certainly you'd want to be talking to a doctor and make sure that there was no secondary issues going on. So one of the big things with um, anybody going through puberty is hygiene. And certainly for kids that may have sensory issues, um, just routine, it makes it very, very difficult. So some of the suggestions are, of course, visual schedules, verbal schedules, using different products. For example, with Isabel, um, my child with autism, who's now 22, last week, um, she did not want to bathe, did not. I mean, it was the biggest issue ever. And so we ordered um, colored soaps and put them in spray bottles so she could spray in the bathtub like, you know, she was four and that helped for a while. We did the, the clay soaps that she could play with and that helped for a while. You know, I got over obviously trying to think that she needed a warm shower when she likes a cold shower. So um, one thing that has very much helped us is that she still washes her hair in a sink, in the laundry sink with the sprayer as opposed to um, in the shower. She'll get in the shower and wash her body, but she doesn't want to wash her hair in the shower. She'll do that in the sink. And you know what? That's okay. Um, it has helped her understand, of course, as she's gotten older that, you know, you need good hygiene for health reasons and for social reasons. People don't want to be around you when you stink, if that, if that can matter to you. And um, certainly, you know, if you don't take care of your hair, it's going to get a bunch of knots in it. And then we have to cut them out, or we have to try and brush through them. Or, um, you know, if you get too much dirt on you, then we have to scrub hard to get it off. So um, explain to them why that's important has helped with our family. This was her shower schedule um, that we we still have in her room and she's 22. Um, but we started this, I think, when she was probably about 10. Um, and it's, as you can see, very, very specific to get her to go through. I mean, everything from turning on the water, um, she has Band-Aids on her fingernails because she bites her fingernails so to take all the Band-Aids off and put them in the trash and, and so forth. Some things we've given up on. Um, you may see on there that it's shave under arms and legs. I've long since given up on that. She's, she's an unnatural girl and that's okay but you can see where we tried to start um, with all of this the other thing of course that we'll talk about is breast development and again hair growth um, with breast development they really do need to wear a bra and it it took us a long time to find a bra that was comfortable to her and now that she wears a bra she she won't take it off um, she sleeps in it and so forth so um, she did not want a sports bra they were too tight on her but she did not want an underwire that was uncomfortable so we ended up settling for just a regular bra with no underwire and again she just wears it all the time and sleeps in it and can't imagine doing it any other way um, but generally they need that for the comfort um, and even for kind of the breast contouring. So to work to find the, the breast development and when to put a uh, bra on them, I would work on the earlier side of things rather than the later. Hair growth, again, that's something in our family we've learned to, to let pass. I'm still hoping that we can get her lasered, but um, it's not something she's interested in. So, you know, you can do shaving, you can do the dilapidatory creams. Laser, again, is something that I'm hoping for, or you just go the way it is. Periods are something that um, can be very, very scary. And growing up in the family with a gynecologist as a mom, you know, my kids, we, we were talking about this when they were four and five years old at the table. So that's one thing I would always encourage you to do is speak directly with the proper words um, about about things that are going to happen to them and explain, truly explain what's happening in the best way that you can for their level. Um, they can wear pads and tampons. I would encourage you, you know, if, if you think you can, there's nothing wrong with a young girl using a tampon. So as soon as they're able, if you feel like you can help them with that and learn how to do that. And certainly now they have the absorbent underwear that was never an option when we were kids, but it is a great product. They have absorbent bathing suits, absorbent underwear, and that has really helped. When my girls went through um, puberty, Isabel, we didn't, they didn't have the absorbent underwear and I got tired of changing her messy sheets because she did not have the hygiene to manage that. So I put her on birth control pills pretty young and you can talk to a gynecologist about this. 
We can use birth control pills in what we call an extended cycle so that you don't have a period. It's not dangerous. I would guarantee you there are very few gynecologists in town that have a period. If they're, they're taking pills, they're all taking extended cycle. Um, so that's one way to help. If nothing else, you can take them regularly and make your periods predictable and shorter, but you can take them extended cycle and get rid of them. The Depo-Provera shot is one option. It's not my favorite. It does tend to make kids a little moodier, a little hungrier. Um, and when they're trying to do all their bone development, it actually decreases their bone development. So I only use it in very specific circumstances, but it's an option. The next one on implant is something that we can put in the arm. So it's not so scary to put in. It's something we can do easily in the office. For most girls, most women, it takes away their period, but they still can have some irregular bleeding with it. So it's not my favorite method of cycle control, but it, it can, for a lot of women, make their period to go away. My favorite method is an intrauterine device. And Isabella ended up needing an endoscopy when she was about, oh gosh, she was probably just 17, certainly not sexually active. And I knew she was gonna be put to sleep. So I begged and pleaded and kind of worked the system a little bit to get an, an IUD placed in her while she was asleep with her knowledge, of course. Um, but I knew she wouldn't tolerate an exam in the office and she wouldn't tolerate the procedure. But to get that in, we have seven years of basically no period. So not only do I know she's protected from pregnancy at an incredible rate, um, we have not had to deal with a period in five years, which, at, Oh, it's lovely. So um, we can talk more about IUDs if y'all are interested in that. Oop. Wait a minute. Um, I think that was the next one. Yes. All right. As they develop sexually, I'm sure many of you have all already started to discover masturbation. It's a difficult topic for anyone to discuss, even with neurotypical kids. But I'll remind you, it is a normal activity. Um, it's a normal activity for neurotypicals. It's a normal typical for kids with autism. Um, the biggest thing that we talked about is whether to do it in a public or private space and um, you know, to not use the same electric toothbrush down there that you use in your mouth. So she gets to. Um, sexuality, you really, again, just like with masturbation, have to know that you're comfortable having those conversations. Um, our kids tend to be very physically mature, but emotionally immature, and they need very specific black and white information. Um, you know, sexual awareness, again, what, what's, of it, what's proper to do in the public, what's proper to do in private, like masturbation, sexual boundaries. Um, we've all heard about the hug circles, you know, wave or, um, or hug or be intimate, you know, those layers of circles that are very important and let them know who's, who's allowed to go into those layers. Um, there's a higher population of kids with autism that are in the LGBTQ um, range or that are asexual. And so to understand those and, and help understand, help them understand um, a lot of them, particularly that I've talked to in the office are very curious um, and kind of want to know what all this fuss is about, but really aren't so interested. I get everything from, well, I tried sex, but I don't know why people would do it. It's just messy. Um, to, you know, there are certainly kids that are young adults that enjoy it and have a good relationship with it, but they're curious enough about it that it helps to answer the questions um, in a direct way from you. Um, often people wanna know when to start a gynecology visit. And again, even for neurotypical kids, the recommendations are that a, a person needs to come to the gynecologist when they're 21 for their first annual exam, pap smear and so forth. Um, sooner if they're having problems with their periods, um, if we need to talk about STDs or they're sexually active sooner. But, you know, again, for our kids that are anxious, I think it can go one of two ways. There's definitely, I think, a theory to start that um, visit early so that they can just develop a relationship with the doctor um, to see someone and know that, you know, it's, it's okay to go in and just talk and that's my person and I can ask questions. Um, most exams, again, are not necessary until they're in their 20s. Um, help communicate with your doctor what would make the visit easier for your child. You know, if they you want to keep in there, Isabel's big about wearing her headphones. So um, if she wants her earphones in, or obviously if they want you in the room, those sorts of things. Um, we also need to discuss appropriate relationships, sexually transmitted diseases, and those kind of things can come from a gynecologist, I think, a little easier than they can come from at home, or at least reinforce. Um, so kind of in going over the, the touch points with all of this, teach early and teach often. You know, our dinner table discussions, I think would, would scare most of you, but 
they know those terms. They know what a vagina is. They know what breasts are. Um, I, you just, you've got to use the terms and got to, and need to talk. There's no gray zones with them. They need to understand as any child does, what is okay and what is not okay. What are those circles? Who can wave, who can, you know, handshake, who can hug to teach them to be able to say no. Um, you know, how, how do you do that? If you know, whether you're getting in front of their favorite TV show and, and they're saying, no, you've got to move, no. And teaching them that it's okay to say no when they feel uncomfortable or if somebody is passing that circle, they're not supposed to. Again, teaching them what's okay in, in privacy and what's okay in the public. Um, my my teenage, my 21 year old daughter here who I'm helping move in felt like I needed to show all of this to you as well because this is the new phrase for everybody. Um, it's called fries. So if you can teach your kids about fries, um, that consent for a relationship is freely given. It's reversible. You can take it back at any time. You need to be informed. Um, you want to be doing it enthusiastically and not feel like you're being forced in any way and to be specific about exactly what's going to happen. So for any of you who are feeling very um, in the know, that's the new college way to say things. Finally, I just want to remind people that um, some teenagers care about smelling good and some don't, neurotypical. Non-compliance is a normal teenage behavior. Teenagers like to make their own choices and they're not yours often. Teenagers do not develop good organizational skills or self-care through osmosis. None of them do. Moodiness and raging hormones are a normal teenage thing. Self-regulation is not practiced by most teenagers. Orderliness is a foreign concept to most teens. Masturbation is a normal teenage activity, but learning about sex from a known and a trusted adult is necessary. And, and what I really want this side to show is obviously we have some extra challenges in kids with autism, but having a teenager is tough no matter what. Um, so it's probably in some ways the most normal we'll feel because everybody else is suffering as well. These were some books that um, I did find. Again, I am by no means an autism expert. It's more just from the kids that I've seen and, and you know, raising, raising my daughter. But um, these are some books that were recommended that may be um, something that you want to look into. Does anyone have any questions? If I'm supposed to be doing something, Allison, tell me. You're doing great. Um, Shannon. Yes. So um, it, this has been so helpful. So in, in looking at the IUD as an option, do you have suggestions for um, our parents as to how to have that conversation with a doctor? I mean, you understood it was not, it. we needed help to make right. that happen. And, and honestly, I think most doctors are going to understand that. Um, you know, nobody wants to put a child to sleep. Nobody wants to do a, a procedure in the operating room that we can do in the office. Um, but, but we know our parents best. And so if you really think that your child can't tolerate it, um, but feel like that is the right option for you and your family and your child, then you just have that conversation with your doctor. Um, I've been amazed. I mean, some kids with autism, honestly, they, they need more boundaries. They need to be more anxious about coming to the doctor, but they just plop down there and do great. And I tell them, you know, it's going to hurt for 10 seconds and boom, they're good. Um, I have others that are just terrified. And I think between the doctor and the parents, and, and hopefully the patient to some extent, we can work through that and decide what's best and, and just know that there are risks of going to sleep, but there's a whole lot of benefits. And if we can get seven years of, of some good self-care and hygiene and, and pregnancy prevention, then that's important. Can I ask you one other thing too? So sure. um, if, if it's sort of typical to, to, to build that relationship with a, um, gynecologist in the 20s do you think is there any benefit in us doing it earlier with with our girls yes that's what i was saying i think particularly in our situation it is more important to build those relationships earlier while they're still before they become more afraid right um so just and gynecologist just, would be open to that at, at oh God, absolutely okay okay Absolutely. I mean, it's a different kind of appointment, right? I mean, we're not, we know that going in, we're, you know, you're just coming in to, to meet and to talk and to 
let them ask a question, sometimes to sit on the table or see what the stirrups look like, or, um, you know, just to see how they're doing in school and see if they have friends. And, you know, the way that I always do it, and again, you play it by ear, but I will almost always try and have a relationship with just the, the teenager by myself. So to have just a moment where the mom or dad steps out and, you know, I can say, okay, is there anything that you want to talk about? Or you want to ask me, or you have questions, you know, we're here for you and it's your body. Obviously that's kind of prefaced with where they are on the spectrum or, or what their difficulties are, but um, to try and give them ownership um, for their body, I think is very, very important. Great. Thank you. Do you have any tips, Dr. Johnson, on preparing um, our girls for for an exam, uh, for a public exam? So, you know, I, honestly, I treat them for the most part the way that I would treat any any person. Everybody's anxious, right? I mean, I think any mom here knows that as neurotypical as we are, when we went for our first exam, we were terrified. Um, so I think you need to have a provider that's going to spend the time to talk about what's going to happen before it happens, you know, to show them a speculum, to show them what it looks like. Um, you know, if they've not been sexually active, I often compare it to a tampon because we'll use the smaller one. I'll say, you know, this is the size of a tampon. You know, have you ever used one of those? And we talk about um, that it's certainly meant to go in, you know, so we, we look at those things ahead of time. Um, so I think that helps just to kind of go through those things. And again, stress that it's their body and they have a choice. Um, there really is not a time that there would be a reason to, to coerce or to force even a child with autism through an exam. There, there just isn't. I mean, if they were that uncomfortable with the exam, then we'd, we'd put them to sleep if we felt like it needed to be done. Allison, I think Natalie has a question. Yes, Natalie, go ahead. Hey, thank you. Hey, Dr. Johnson, I have a question about at what age should they be getting, um, I guess, should their pediatrician be looking at them without their clothes on or should they, should that come? I, actually, my daughter had a well check today and I was expecting her at 11 to just kind of check her out, you know, but she didn't, not to say that that's the wrong way, but is there, yeah. is, is there any merit to that? There is, you want to make sure that they're developing normally. So generally it's just a, again, a quick peek to see. It's easier to see pubic hair and kind of get that tanner stage in a way than it is to do breast development. Cause with breast development, normally you need to feel whether they've got that breast bud and that can make kids feel uncomfortable and, and it can be a little tender. Um, so that quick kind of pubic hair look can give you an idea of where they are in their tanner stages. Um, so certainly I wouldn't say that it's wrong not to look, but it's also not wrong to look. And at 11, um, I think most of the time you would be just taking that quick peek to make sure everything was okay. Again, with your daughter's permission. Yeah. I'll just ask for that. The next appointment. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. Did I do that good of a job explaining it to everyone? That's wonderful. You actually did a very good job explaining it all. Thank you. Um, can I ask a question? <laughs> this is Michelle. Sure. Um, okay, so how long typically does for a period do you, to start birth control? Um, because my child is Down syndrome and now new diagnosis with autism recently. Mm -hmm. So um, I have intellectual also mixed in right. with other sensory issues. So how when old is should she? we? She's 12. She has not started her period yet. So obviously you'd want her, do you feel like she's close based on the developmental signs that we talked about? Definitely. Yes. Okay. Yes. Um, so, and I, I assume that you have talked to her about this at length, correct? Yes, we've discussed it. Um, she has basic understanding at times. So. Okay. Uh, but I would assume she's also not probably left alone very often either. So if she started her period, she'd have a caring adult with her fairly quickly that would be able to kind of reinforce that this was okay. Yes, definitely. Yes. Yes. Once her period starts, really at that time, you can start birth control pills. You know, again, in, in a completely neurotypical, we'd like to see them get through a couple of cycles just to make sure they were, they were truly kind of hitting it because they can 
occasionally have a period and not have another one for several months or you know, six months, eight months, but that's not typical. Most of the time when they start, they start fairly consistently. Their periods may be off. They may not be on that 28 week or 28 day schedule like we are, we'd like them to be, but they're starting. And so it's reasonable that you could go ahead, particularly in an unusual situation. You know, I, I think you have to have a doctor that understands that for you. That's awesome. Cause we, we went, it was at least age seven before we were completely potty trained and I, I just can't see putting her through that or me. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. Okay. Thank it's, you so much. You are welcome. Yeah. I will tell you, I mean, again, Isabel's fairly high functioning. She, she does a great job with so many things, but hygiene and her having a period, I, I mean, just, I, I was washing sheets. <laughs> I, felt, I felt like I was in a horror movie half the time. I, I couldn't do it anymore. <laughs> Well, I, so, I want to say thank you so much about the hygiene because I'm struggling with that now and thank you I kind of feel like I'm, we're normal <laughs> so oh, thank you for for saying that that's amazing so thank you're you you're not thank alone you. well and again that's really we have extra issues right I mean Isabel but figuring out the things like she doesn't for whatever reason want to wash her hair in the shower she just doesn't um okay but I will also tell you that you know some of my other kids are not so great with that. It's, it is a time of change for everyone. And I don't know if you have other children, but it is a normal thing to struggle with a, a perfectly neurotypical child. And it's just these struggles are extra hard because they're not always a two-way conversation the way that we want to kind of work through and discuss the pros and the cons and why we have to do it. But you just go through those lists. And eventually, like I said, at 22, she now, she takes her shower every other day and she washes her hair every third day. It works for her and I'm okay with it. Do we have any other questions? Well, I should have put my email on here. Um, you guys are all welcome to, to, you know, text me or email me with other questions, Lisa and Susan have it. I can tell you it's, if anybody's ready for it, or I can give it to Allison and she can, can post it somewhere, but um, I'm happy to answer other questions if you have some. And like I said, I think anytime that you're working with a doctor that you're comfortable with, um, there's lots of things that we can do that, that can make things a lot easier for a family to deal with. We greatly appreciate the fact that you live it and understand it. That makes a huge difference in, in having conversations. And uh, we appreciate that you are a resource for so many families of daughters uh, who, are, who are going to, to go through all of this. It, it helps to have someone to speak with. Well, good. I hope I've answered your questions. Like I said, I, I didn't know which way to take it necessarily. So it sounds like, like we've gotten answered and they change, you know, when you've got a six-year-old, it's very different from when you have a 12-year-old or when you have a 19-year-old, so. This was very helpful. Thank you so much, Dr. Johnson. You are welcome. All right, if anybody has any other questions, don't hesitate to contact me. Thank, Thank you so much, so we much. appreciate Thank it. You. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah, Blend.